Hello, welcome to Mark Langley's Horsemanship Podcast, a podcast helping people to understand their horses better, to provide solutions in a calm, connected way. I'm Jenny Barnes. And I'm Mark Langley. Hi Mark, your first question this week is from Tim. Tim has a problem with his horse who is crawling out and on high alert and head high when he comes in for preparation for grooming and supplements. So he can hear people talking on a veranda but he can't actually see them. He's used your flag against his leg and he's hold his ground confidently which does get him to change his thought for a little while but have you got any ideas on how to help him stay calmer and more focused when he can't see where the noise is coming from? Yeah, I was thinking about that question and I, I often wonder with horses like that what, what their past was, how they were weaned, things like that. Because those horses that hear noises and can't see things and they start to call and get quite restless and stuff like that, you know, I often think that they were the horses that were weaned in a box and they, they heard their mum or their mum disappeared and they couldn't see where they were and, and they hear this noise, they're calling outside and then they call and then there's random calls and it sets up something like that and I, and I see that quite a bit, whether that's the case with your horse or not. Um, you know, you know, if you don't know, who knows, I don't, you know, I don't know, but um, sometimes I think um, that sort of thing sets horses up to be a bit like that and when they get in confined spaces and they hear noises, they... But it's interesting here in the human noises, um, they get a little bit like that calling out and stuff. Um, basically, you've got to look at it as two things. Is the horse comfortable going into that space first? Because the amount of anxiety that's in there is causing the horse to destinate a little bit. So anything happening outside, it's latching onto or, you know, um, and it's obviously worried in there for those noises, obviously, to worry it or... Uh, it, it's it, as I say, latching onto those noises. So, um, so, so I would actually start to work on um, grading the exposure as you go in. Like treat treat the process of going into the area where where the where you know where where you're talking about there to to, to do all those things. Um, I would treat it like you're loading onto a sort of difficult horse float, and you know uh, when your horse starts to um, get anxious. Um, maybe say that's our first hurdle and maybe so so imagine go get, get a lot lot more in tune with your horse as you're walking in t- towards that space and as soon as you feel your horse start to sort of go oh uh, you know you feel a change in your horse from the sort of horses just plonking along behind you nice and comfortable to a horse that goes oh I just feel a little anxious as soon as you feel that anxiety start to come up you know you've hit your first your, your first threshold, which is your first uh, hurdle. So um, there's a few things you can do when you hit that first hurdle is you can sort of um, stop there and maybe back the horse up a step to say let go of that anxiety and come forward a step until the horse centres. Let it think about, okay, come down a little bit. Okay, I'm not just getting forced into that scary place. I've got time to think. And then you might just take your horse away a little bit and come back again. Um, and, and if you feel any brace, any resistance, you just kind of maybe backwards, forwards over that sort of where the line was drawn where the horse got anxious until the horse softens a little and then maybe take it away and come back again and slowly break down the barriers that the horse is setting as it's walking into there, um, those barriers of anxiety when the horse is telling you there's something that's, it's not liking and it doesn't like it in there um, and try and make it think, of, um, so, so you might even see it start to destinate um, so instead of waiting till it's really anxious and calling when it hears noises that it can't see and stuff like that or getting anxious about those noises, um, you might see the horse start to sort of destinate in its thoughts, you know, 50 metres from where usually you, you see the bigger problem. Um, and then and then you kind of, and then that's when you could probably distract your horse to bring its thoughts back into that area, soften and centre, give it time to come down and go to think about that area, then take it away, come back again. And you might find that you can actually get all the way into that space and the horse is a lot calmer, a lot, a lot more comfortable with the space it's in. It's got had time to think about it. Um, so that could be part of the reason that space is causing problems. And it, can, it also could go back, stem back to, um, you know, weaned, weaned in a box somewhere in the past. And uh, So that's something I'll definitely work on. The other thing is... Um, you could set it up that some people are out there and and they, they and um, as soon as before the horse 
gets a little anxious, you get them to make a little bit of noise. As soon as you see the thoughts latch on to that, that you break the thought. It's almost like um, an example would be at a clinic, for instance, if I've got a horse that comes into the arena and suddenly starts screaming uh, out, but then all of a sudden you hear another whinny outside and you know that when that horse whinnies, you've got a few seconds on the clock before this horse is going to go Wah! and whinny. So just as you hear that horse outside whinny, that's when you distract the horse that you've got. So before your horse whinnies and gets all anxious, you get someone to sort of say something out there and as soon as they've done that, before the horse starts to tap out, you reset it a little earlier. So you gather its thoughts a little little sooner, whether that be popping the flag, getting it to ask it, asking a soft question to see if it can sort of reset a little. Um, and, and intervene a little early until what starts to happen is you do an experiment and, and someone will make a noise outside and uh, then all of a sudden you go, oh crikey, the horse hasn't, hasn't, uh, hasn't responded to that. Um, instead of waiting for the big response and then, you know, so I'd intervene a little early when the anxiety is a little bit more manageable um, and I'd say it happens before you see the big anxiety, I'd say it's happening a bit earlier. And if you intervene a little earlier, that means you're grading the exposure of the way the horse walks in there. And, and then by the time you're in there, it m might be a little bit better at, at those things that are happening outside as well. Staying on the subject of anxiety, Hermini has a question for you with her horse, her mare, who is getting some good relaxation and confidence riding in the arena and all around the property. This is since uh, your clinic. In, over in WA. Um, how, <clears throat> excuse me. However, she took her out somewhere different and nothing could help her relax. So it was a really big public riding area. She responded to the leading and all the leg aids, but they weren't helping her find relaxation. Occasionally she got some softness, but as soon as she let her stand, she went straight back to her high alert, destinating state. I tried just standing. <coughs> I don't know again. Well, the next question is from Hermini, and um, she has a similar question to do with um, anxiety, and she's struggling to get her horse relaxed in a new environment. So she's been getting confidence riding in the arena and around the property, but she took her somewhere different. It was a big public riding area, and nothing seemed to help her relax. She responded to the leading and all the leg aids, but they weren't helping her find relaxation. Occasionally she got some softness, but as soon as she let her stand, she went straight back to her high alert, destinating state. So she tried to stand for a while and let her look around, and she tried distracting her every time she got tense. She tried letting her go for a walk, um, but she was by herself, and even though she stayed out there for about four hours, there wasn't much improvement. So she's wondering if you have any suggestions that might help her relax when she's out. It's a difficult one, that one. It's a, it's a, it's um, and and just from past experience from the uh, the clinic that you're on in um, Western Australia with her, um, there was that instance, and I just think if you put your mind to that instance where um, we had some really good responses with her, and and she um, she responded well to the things we were teaching. She she got a lot softer with the reins and. Uh, you know, that anger started to go with, you know, a lot of the aids that you're offering her and stuff like that. But there was that, that sort of lesson where she just kind of was bothered by the end of the arena for, for one particular lesson and um, and just t telling her to let go of that wasn't quite working. And then, um, um, and you remember I had a bit of a fiddle with her and, and took her up that end of the arena and, and sort of worked on just letting her kind of go towards what because she was kind of interested in knowing what she was scared of and that's what I found you know quite good that she wanted to do that uh, and 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 when I sort of just graded the exposure to the end of the arena then you did it um, you noticed after that she said well I've done that now I've let that go and I'm okay and then she settled down and we didn't have to offer all those distractions so 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 for me that sort of um, showed me the sort of caliber of the mare that sometimes it's very hard to interrupt her because those things mean a lot to her so somehow I think 
until you've got a really good thing going with her that everything's really starting to, 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 to work really well, um, sometimes you're going to have to just figure out how you can grade that exposure to those, those scary things. So maybe, um, maybe don't write her. Um, you know, if, if she get there and you know she's just like everything seems to be buzzing, uh, you know, making her buzz, and then maybe when you get her off the float, just maybe stay near the float and just work on resetting her. You know, near the float, you know, that's a place you both know. It's and 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 just resetting her on the ground and just take her for a little journey and come back and don't don't even ride her. Just let her gauge and do a bit of a recce first and uh before you get on her and try and tell her to let go of those things because i think she's getting a lot more um confident with you know the foundation you're putting on her is, is you 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 know you, you you're ultimately getting quite a sensitive also um expression at mare with a certain amount of sensory processing you, you know you've got you've, you've started to get her to kind of be comfortable with pressure and things like that um as in more comfortable, but you could also see how uncomfortable she is with pressure and has been with pressure, and how all the little things like rib pressure and everything you you got to you know someone else can get on a horse and go oh yeah got my horse moving off the legs beauty what's the next thing and that horse is like yeah I'm moving off the legs what's the next thing but with her you've got to prove to her that the legs are okay you've got to spend a lot of time getting her you know comfortable. Um, with the fact that you're going to use your legs and then how to respond to those legs and things like that. So you've got to work harder uh, because of her sort of sensory processing to prove to her that all those things are okay. So now you're understanding that and, and um, she's starting to feel okay, more okay with those things, then it's going to be very easy to go, okay, all oh, right, she's going good, let's go and go for a big ride, we'll do this, we'll do that. But But you've also got to sort of recognise that how hard it was in a sort of calm environment you know to get her to get comfortable with the simple things like reins and legs and stuff like that so you've you've got to sort of always have that in mind that okay um i've got to have these foundations really good that you know you almost don't have to go back and keep trying ticking those boxes because they're already done they, they should you know so um i guess what i'm saying is as soon as as soon as she's a bit overwhelmed in a new environment, those things that you were working really hard to get her comfortable with will still have issues as well. The things that you can control, she'll still be anxious with a bit because if it was so hard to get her in a calm environment to be comfortable with, and then they're obviously still going to cause her um, an extra amount of white noise, which will kind of, that, that, and that's that, that what causes a bit of an overload. So um, keeping in mind that the things that you can control she was so sensitive with then you've got to when you get her to a fairly new you know for her hostile environment um you you've got to sort of work within her thresholds of the e so the easiest things that you can do with her that aren't going to add too much sensory overload so for instance like riding her and legs legs and stuff like that might be too much of an ask even though she was listening to them it might still be too much of an ask to try and get her to listen to those and cope with this whole new environment at the same time. So, so I think with the new environment, if you find that it's a really big thing for her, then the only thing you need to work on is that environment. And, um, um, so you go back a peg, which means maybe get off her, um, get her just comfortable so she can look, assess the environment, you know, send her with you on the ground and just, you know, maybe set up a bit of a, a pretend sort of you know ally territory there which is might you know might be 100 meters or 50 meters from your float that you might start on and just say right out you know you can see that over there you've been here you've been around there you've started to center and relax now i might just get on you the float i might just do on you at the float and do a couple of little things here and then get off and um and maybe just m allow her to have a few experiences like that because um if she has too many overwhelming experiences when she goes out i think you're, you're setting it up that that overwhelming experience will be what she remembers um, of, of sort of floundering around and being lost and then it'll be, you know, but halfway there she'll start to get anxious so she'll already be prepared um, as in, you know, she's already throwing herself off the deep end. So 
Um, go back to the things in, in the training that you can remember that she f found easiest, the things that you can control, and, and usually that's probably some of the groundwork things, um, you know, being on the ground, and, and then help her in that sense with the new environment and then when you think she's going I'm okay with the environment then get on and, and do some of your writing stuff but your priority is to help her in that new environment um, with whatever you can do with her to, to show her that you did help her and you're together as a team and the new environment soon becomes like oh well I can do that the more she can do that the, the better the better she'll be but the more she gets overwhelmed um, for a horse like her with such a you know high level of um, you know such a sensitive horse with a high level of anxiety and sensory processing then f f f you know if I was to predict she's the sort of horse that would like like the sort of person that would suffer more from post-traumatic stress syndrome if they got sent onto the battlefield and, 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 and had a meltdown too many times. Thanks Mark and I'm just going to um, just mention to anyone that's listening that um, if you want to ask Mark a question, it's uh, not just going to one of his clinics, you need to be an online member. So um, we offer quite a um, reduced online membership. Um, we try and make it available to everybody and anyone who is a, a current online member can ask Mark a question and um, you get that opportunity to ask him a question every fortnight and then he answers um, everyone's questions at the moment. He's able to get through all of them. So thank you for, your, for the huge amounts of time you give Mark. It's, it's really a cheap membership and um, we um, would love to see more of you join. Uh, the next question Mark is from Greta. It's a completely different question. She's got a four year old off the track thoroughbred who lives in a paddock all on her own. She can see other horses, but Greta is wondering what your thoughts are on her having very minimal contact with other horses, she, and especially because she's so young. So she does get to have play dates from time to time, to time to time with one of her friend's horses. She does enjoy it, but she comes straight into season afterwards. Um, she's also wondering, and I quite like this question, and I'm curious myself, would you approach training a horse that lives alone any different to horses that live in herds? Um, she's also wondering if um, living by herself could cause any sort of uh, emotional or um, you know psychological damage to her. She's really expressive, she can be a handful and Greta has actually had a problem riding her, she's come off her, so she's lost a little bit of confidence and she only rides her in the round yard at the moment. Um, well I'll, I'll answer I guess the, 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 the question about do I approach training differently to horses <coughs> that are with herds and horses without herds, no. I don't. I just train what's in front of me. <laughs> so, um, never ever go into training thinking that that's how you're going to train your horse. That's that's a, a advice I'd give everybody. It's it's um you know once upon a time there was a bit of a talk about left introvert, right brain introvert. Um, what, you know what category does your horse fit into, and this is the type of training that that you should do with this horse um, you can make a big mistake by thinking this is the way I have to train this horse because this is its situation and a horse will off offer you introvert extrovert personality in that lesson and and horses are constantly evolving with the education that we're giving them um, depending if it's going well or not um, and I think you know your horse comes in it's 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 off its trolley for instance, well, you just got to help it come down. Um, your horse comes in shut down and, well, you've got to help it with where it's at. And, yeah, you can never predict, doesn't matter if they're in or out, out of a herd. You just, you know, they're going to come in and they're going to they're gonna be thinking one thing um, and you can't be thinking another thing. You have to be going, well, what are they thinking and how can I help them, you know, feel better and... Uh, and, and learn the, the, the first most simple thing that we might need them to understand. Um, so yeah, training is just how it, you know, and that's why, um, you know, I, I like being able to help people online, I like being able to answer all these questions. Um, I, I, I like knowing that, um, that that people contact me back and say, you know, you know, I've really had, had some good results with my horse and I haven't even met them. 
Um, so it's nice to know that I can have that reach on horses and people to help them. Um, and even the video subscription that I that I I, I um, have available for people, um, I, I found it really hard to, to, to put those videos out there because I was very worried that people might see what well, my training is, oh, this is how I train a horse and this is the method and, you know, I, I did it your way and I did, I've done your method or uh, I, don't, I don't want people to see it like that. Um, I want them to see each individual lesson um, and, and, and if there's something in there for them and their horses that's so important and, and, and I think that's how you should take training horses and interacting with people, horses, all throughout your life is you get what you get right in front of you and, and that's what you're dealing with every time. Um, and treat it like that um, all the time, I think. And, uh, yeah, going on to the rest of it, though, should your horse be in a herd? Yes. Um, you know, like the play date and, and, and the mare coming into season when she meets other horses, um, or, well, if you were sort of locked up on your own, then you would be a bit more extravagant when you m meet other people, um, as in, you know, your emotions would get a lot higher because it's almost like, have you ever, like even herds, like the dynamics, if you put a new horse in a herd, that, that whole inertia that nobody wants to see sometimes, you almost want to turn away because you go, oh God, I can't watch that. Um, it's kind of horrible what horses will do to sort of say, you're not allowed in my herd. Um, so you, you imagine just you know a herd change and the dynamics in that. So so you can imagine a horse being kept on its own and then having a play date and then getting kept on its own. It's a it's a, it's a big experience for that horse to go through. So there's going to be a lot more anxiety, big emotions, hormone you know whatever you know hormone arousal stuff like that that just 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 off the radar. So so to get a horse more you know a horse has to have a fairly stable environment that it lives in. Um, now, then that would come to the next question, so to keep it stable, do I not have play dates and just keep it on, a, on its own? Well, no, because I, I disagree with keeping horses on their own. That's, 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 that's the, way, the way I am, and, and that's the, I believe they're a herd animal and they need company. And I think it's very important that, that um, if we're going to own horses, we, we try and, you know, offer that to them. Um, because yeah, and I don't. I wouldn't say if you if you can't have another horse and you have to keep it on its own, restrict the play dates. I still think it, it should still have interaction with other horses. But you're going to know it's going to be kind of a a big experience for that horse every time, and you can't expect it just to settle down. Because you know, two weeks between play dates is a lot of time on its own. So every play date's always going to be a big a big exposure. And also, you know, there's the other complication. Uh, people say oh, I've got to leave my horse on its own because um, because then, um, then it won't have separation anxiety, but then they want to go riding with their friends, and it's such an emotional experience being around all those other horses that the horse feels like it's got that anxiety anyway because of the, the change from being on its own to suddenly being around the dynamics of other horses. So, so you still suffer anyway when you, when you, when you go out um, with, 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 with that, 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 that anxiety. Um... I believe there are horses that I've seen on their own that um, have got used to living on their own and, and they'll sleep, like, you know, some people say that you need horses around for one horse to truly get into deep sleep, but then um, there are horses that have learnt that in the comfort, the comfort of their yard, they've learnt that they're safe in that pad, little paddock they're in and they have, you know, they sleep and they, they seem like they're not on high alert and they, they rest well, they're sitting in the paddock, sleeping in the paddock and all that sort of stuff and they seem to have all the normal rest behaviours of a, of a, of a, a horse that's not, not sort of, you know, that, that would usually have a herd around to it to, for, for that sort of, you know, safety in numbers. So there are horses that adapt better than other horses to living on their own but at the end of the day they are a herd animal and I still think it's important that, that you try and somehow give them give them company because um you know you might be out there you know for an hour every day but the horse is out there all night all day on its own you know and yeah anyway just that's all, that's yeah so <laughs> I'm, I, I might just mention too that with our herd um I see them 
um, grooming each other an awful lot. So it's not just a case of knowing that there's company and they can keep watch for you where you eat or while you sleep. Um, I think that we, uh, we sometimes perhaps might undervalue um, how much they need that physical contact with their friends. Mm. They spend a lot of time nibbling at each other and grooming each other. Um, so that you know, there needs to be time for that. And I do know of people that have um, found companions. You know, whether they've got a little goat or a little sheep or a little mini horse, they've sort of done the best they could in the situation they've got with another animal. And perhaps that's something that you could think about too. Yeah, that's better than it's. It, all those things are going to be better than better. Um, and yeah, just that, just that company is nice, and they like it. And yeah. Thank you for your question, and um, it's nice to hear people that you know can ask uh, anything that they want to to Mark. Let's keep their questions coming. And the last question for this week, Mark, is from Carolyn. She's asking, what would you look for, and maybe exercises you would do, um, when you're assessing a new horse, whether it's appropriate for you? Um, well, I'm, I'm going to assume... Maybe that this is a horse that's already a ridden horse or something that you know you want to ride um, that's that's already started. Um, it's there's so many things to look for, and I'm guessing, and this is one you'll probably already know the answer. This one is basically general soundness, um, you know, physical physical soundness. So you know, up and down, you know, feet, legs. Um, movement, all that sort of stuff, and, and that's some, something you get a vet to check. You know, if you're not sure yourself, uh, I won't go through all those physical things, but that's, you know, that's really important that, that you do get a good vet check because there's a lot of lot of, um, you know, hidden problems that, you know, get sold in horses and then they can't be ridden and people pay good money for them. So, but the things I look for uh, in some exercises like. Um, well, an exercise that I want the person to do that I'm buying the horse off, if I was buying it to be a safe horse for myself or my kids or anyone, um, I would want to I, I would want to see them ride it, and I would want to see them ride it not just in the arena. I would want to see the horse let out on a loose rein. I'd want to see it, you know, slowed down. I'd want to see it trotted out and cantered out on a loose rein. I want to know that it's not jammed up and held up. Um, and and I'd also want to I'd also look very closely you know you know I'd, I'd want to see the horse out the gate I'd want to see it sort of pushed into a fast canter up into a kind of a gallop those things I'd, I'd like to see um, because you know technically if you're buying a ridden horse that started uh, the horse should be able to do those things okay uh, and you can hide a lot of things by just kind of um, you know, riding in an arena and just getting a horse to do certain patterns that it knows. Um, and then I'd, I'd like to sort of say if that person was riding a pattern on that horse or just riding a figure eight, I said, oh, could you just straighten it up and just maybe, you know, just canter it up there or just go over and do that or just do something a little bit different with the horse. And I just watched really closely for, for how the horse, um, you know, if they interrupt it, if, if it sort of gets really worried and things like that. And you'd want to know that the horse has galloped out on a loose rein and all that sort of stuff outside. Um, and if they, if, they, if they didn't, the explanation for why should be very clear. Why? Why didn't, why couldn't you gallop, why couldn't you loosen up that horse? What's the reason? And listen real hard for that reason because, um, you know, that reason could be a valid reason like if someone came to see one of my horses and and um and and I didn't do it I'd have a very good reason for why I didn't and then I and if it was cause of lack of education or the horse is not in that spot I'd be selling it with the person knowing full well that this horse is still getting started and it's still you know and they're buying you know at, at that risk I suppose um the other things I'm really looking forward to uh, looking looking um looking into is is you know, is the horse just kind of, you know, bracy, like, I, you know, leading lessons. I just kind of just gently lead them up, slow them down, and just feel for the brace and resistance in them. 
and do they look really still? Like when you look at them, are they really still? Are they kind of not flicking their ears much? Are they are they not really communicating with the person? And that if they're a bit shut down, that could be all well, and you can fix it. But you got to know that you're getting that um, because some of the sort of frozen shut down horses that kind of work obediently in the um, uh, to the certain patterns that the, the that the person's riding them with, or what the the groundwork patterns um, and they might be look obedient and all like bomb proof, but then you take them out of their element and they're and they're and they're just just off their dial. So, um, is the horse looking like it's thinking about its environment? Is it engaging with you? Is it is it sort of standing there, kind of you know? And if you did something, it flicks an ear and goes, yeah, got that, yeah, got this, or is it just kind of you know really really still? So another little thing I'd I'd do with a horse that looks a bit rigid and still is I just do a random little spook. As I just might clap my hands quickly or do something a little random, and 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 see the extent that that horse panics. Uh, some horses might go, oh, "What was that?" Some horses just might tighten up and freeze a little bit more, and they may not look like they explode. But if they didn't do anything and they didn't go, "Oh," like in a soft, natural way, then they've just held it in a little bit more. So the bigger explosion is going to have more anxiety come out. So so little random things like that, I'd, I'd be doing with the horses. Um, oh crikey, we go all night about all the things you can <laughs> do with a horse. Podcast, um, you know, there's. A, I almost, I think I did an answer once about, uh, or might have, might have written it down in a years, years years ago about what things to look for when you buy a new horse. But um, um, it's like when I used to start horses, and I don't know what the bars changed, but when I used to start a lot of horses in a country area, uh, when you're doing stock horses, and there was an expectation. And, and and it was kind of like a tall expectation in a sense, but I didn't take 20 horses or 15 or 10 horses. I only took, uh, you know, five or six on um, at a time because in a day, to do the proper job on each one, I'd, 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 I'd only take that small amount because I had them a fairly short amount of time. But it was kind of like an expectation that so I... Um, the, the horses had to accept a pair of shoes, so, so I'd have to have them all shod. Nowadays, people don't worry so much. There's more people that, that have barefoot horses, but, but when I was, you know, doing it, everyone, you know, the horse has to be able to be shod. And then the next thing, you know, the next expectations were, were, were was basically when they pick up the horse, they want to see it ridden out of the yards. Uh, has to be walked, trotted, cantered, and galloped. And it has to be seen that that horse can cope with those things, you know, with the with the dries of bone on, like a raincoat on, and crack a whip and open and shut a gate, and know that the horse can ride out through the bush and do that. It didn't have to necessarily have done cattle work or anything like that, but it, yeah, yeah, it. I guess everyone sort of, you know, basically the expectation was is that if the horse was started, that that you should be able to, you know, get on it and ride it out the gate and go and go and do stuff on it um, and there's a lot of horses getting sold that had 10 years work and you still can't do that on so you have to be very careful it's a, it's a sort of a minefield out there of sort of you know fairly uneducated horses um, getting sold so you have to be careful and that's why I say if the person doesn't want to ride the horse uh, because of this and because of that well well you know there's got to be a good reason um, you know a, a good seller should ride the horse and also I think they should allow you a bit of time to sort of you know ride with them you know or you ride the horse they ride the horse you, you know you're buying a, a, an animal and and I, and I and I think I think it's very good that you understand that animal before you buy it so so I think you need to do that with your horse you have to have that bit of time with them um you get a good feel of them. So, yeah, it's easy to buy a car or motorbike, but even that's a hard thing. So. Wonderful. Thank you for your insights, Mark, and we look forward to talking to you again soon. Yeah, no worries. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jenny. You can learn more from Mark online through his online training videos. Just search Mark Langley Horsemanship. There's over 380 training videos which everyone has access to with a seven day free trial. If you like what you see, it's just $15 a month from there. That's help where you need it.